When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. I don't know if there's any way to, to follow 1 John. 2 John is good, but it can't, it can't touch what we've already studied. I'm glad there's a sequel, uh, but I wish John would have given us even more because what he already taught us in his first epistle is love and God is, that's who he is and how he feels about you and how you ought to feel about him and about each other and overcome the world. And there's the proof, that's all the proof you need that you are prioritizing things that truly matter. Well, in this very, very brief second letter, let's talk a little bit more about that. In some ways, just by way of confirmation about your love, mix that with truth, because it's truth that overcomes the wickedness of the world and sees through its falsehoods. That's what it means to choose the right set of parents, so you'd be children of the covenant. All these things that he talked about in the first letter. In some ways... Would the Bible still be complete without 2nd and 3rd John? Yeah. There's not a ton of new material here. But in some ways, it's all, and because they're so short, it's almost like we stumbled across some private communication that was never meant for full canonization to the whole Christian world. But the fact we found something, some scrap of stationery from John the Beloved that gave faint echoes of something that he did write in a full-fledged letter to the church. Oh, let's include it in the same, <laughs> in the same compilation. Let's preserve it. If I, I see Pete scholars who work on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's just this tiny fragment of parchment or papyrus from ages ago, and, but every scrap there was a little bit of writing on it. It's like, can we make out a letter? Can we make out a word? Is there a phrase we can start trying to fit the puzzle pieces together? This is a treasure. And to feel that way about 2 John and 3 John, if there's a scrap of paper with his handwriting on it, I want it. Well, let's see what it said. Verse 1, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Mm, that's more like the kinds of salutations we learned from, we got used to in Paul. Give them grace, offer them mercy, grant them peace. But what I love is the beginning. Who's he writing to? And who's the one writing? This is the elder. Okay, so this John. Unto the elect lady and her children. Who's that? Is there some woman there? Is this a Priscilla? Is this a Lydia? Is this some, you know, the mother of John Mark? Some of these amazing sister saints that had houses that they turned into house churches. It sounds like the, there's the elect lady. Her children? Any that are there? And is this... Literal children or metaphorical ones? In fact, let's turn the whole thing metaphorical. And I love the symbolism. Because instead of John writing to some woman and her kids, what if the elder here really is our elder brother, namely Jesus Christ? If this is a brief love letter from the Savior unto the elect lady. Now, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved ah, the church. The elect lady is the church of Jesus Christ. It's the Israel of Jehovah. And who are her children? Hmm, well, if we took Christ's name upon us through ordinances in the church, then we are children of that covenant, spiritually begotten sons and daughters unto them. Blood, water, spirit, all we saw from the previous letter. So imagine this as, to me, this is my favorite way to read this brief letter. 
as if it were a message coming from Jesus to the church that he loves and the children of the covenant that have been begotten in him. With that in mind, of course he's sending grace and mercy and peace. Of course he loves us in the truth. And it is truth and love coming together that he's trying to convey to us. This is Paul's speaking the truth in love. It's a beautiful contrary. Truth sometimes comes across as the justice side of things. Love, of course, comes off the mercy side of things. But those two have to be joined. Otherwise, we'll speak the truth unlovingly. Or we'll pretend to be loving, but shy away from truth. We have to do both. So verse 4, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. Oh, and it came as a relief, believe me, but also a source of great rejoicing. I knew what you were up against. The seducers, the antichrist, the schism of people who claimed that Jesus had not come in the flesh. No, you are there, holding firm, walking in truth, and I couldn't be happier. I rejoice. Any of you who are holding firm to the iron rod, despite the fact that your loved ones have, have strayed, please know that the Lord rejoices over you. He holds out hope for your loved one too, by the way. He'll rejoice in them as they return, and prodigals typically do. But this rejoicing that you're walking in truth, my hat's off to all of you who are holding firm to the end. He then says, as we have received the commandment from the Father, that's what you're walking according to. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Sound familiar from the first letter? In the beginning, how he started the first letter, how he started the gospel. To obey, to walk after the commandments, and that's evidence that you love God and love your neighbor. It's all right here. And this is, this is nothing new. It's been here from the beginning, so this is an everlasting covenant, though it's been renewed in these days. A new and everlasting covenant to love as the Savior loves. That's what we signed up for. Then verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Is this sounding familiar from his first letter? Who are these deceivers? Well, they're the seducers he mentioned before. As he puts it here, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Oh, and there's the title he used in the first letter as well. So, what's his advice? Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And in some ways, this is the reward of a missionary. Oh, the joy that they feel in the life of a convert. But to think of that compared to the sorrow they feel when that convert falls away, does that seem to rob them of some of their reward? And I don't mean some kind of like payment they get bonus points in heaven for people they converted. No, the, the reward of their joy. And what, this is the reward of parents. Parents rejoicing in their children's faithfulness. We're going to see more of that in these two letters in just a moment. But think about the rewards that the Lord is trying to offer his children for sharing the gospel, for embracing the gospel, for living the gospel. But we've got to keep on living it. Okay? So beware of those deceivers. Overcome those antichrists. Hold out faithful to the end. In verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. And those are the people he's warning them about and inviting to return. If you'll just come, hold to the doctrine of Christ. It includes faith, which you had at one point, but you've lost. It includes repentance, which means you can still return. It includes baptism, where you supposedly laid the old man of sin to, into the grave. You weren't supposed to dig them up again. No, that's a zombie I don't want to be haunted by. Instead, what am I seeking? Well, the doctrine of Christ includes the Holy Ghost. And if he can be my constant companion, then yes, I will abide in God. So I love that he's emphasizing the doctrine of Christ here. He reemphasizes it in the next verse. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, 
receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed, for he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. There really is some concern on John's part about those seducers, those deceivers, those antichrists that are pulling people away from the true faith, that he delivered them, that are standing in the way of the doctrine of Christ. To this elect lady and her children, church members, John is telling them to beware. Not to wish them Godspeed and good luck on your journey and, and I hope much success to your endeavors. It's like, no, 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 no. You don't want to give those well wishes. This is the enemy team. So he says in conclusion, having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. So yeah, you're not the only elect woman out there. There are branches of the church scattered across the Mediterranean. And these saints salute you just as you would salute them. I wish we could all be together. Can, can we have, hold a general conference? <laughs> Is there some way to gather the saints together under one roof so that we can see each other face to face? There'd be a fullness of joy. I don't know about you, but when I get to go to places like General Conference or State Conference and just see people I haven't seen in a while, it's like Zone Conference in the mission field. It's like, yes, old companions and people I served alongside. And what sociality there existed. There's something beautiful here about John. Very brief letter, 13 verses is all we get. Just enough to remind you, stay strong. Uh, beware of those that they're coming and going and, and do not fall prey to their seductive deceptions. Hold to the faith, keep the doctrine, and man, I wish I could, why am I even writing it at all? Well, I guess I have to. That's all I've got. I'm going to write this. I'd rather be penning it or etching it into the fleshy tables of your heart. I hope it's still there, but really I'd rather just be there in person so we can rejoice together. Well, put a stamp on it, send it off anyway. Uh, I'm not sure when my next chance to be with these elect ladies and covenant children will be. Well, no wonder there needed to be a third letter. <laughs> Another opportunity for John to say, hey, I'm still thinking about you. Yes, I'd still rather be there in person, but since I haven't been able to come yet, let me send off another. There's so many missionaries coming and going and saints traveling around, and since I can't come directly yet, I'm going to send another letter with one of them. Now, the last one, he addressed it to the elect lady, her covenant children. This one, he has a, a more specific person in mind. Harder to make this one symbolic when his name is right here. But still, consider yourself part of this covenant group and know that this letter is intended for you as well. Third John, verse 1, the elder, elder John, unto the well-beloved Gaius whom I love in the truth. And there's truth and love, this contrary, spoken together in the same phrase once again. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. Those are the external blessings. Even as thy soul prospereth, and those are the internal blessings. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. Oh, and that's a good report. That's the kind of report every return missionary wants to hear from their former investigators or converts. You're still walking in the truth. I wish I knew more about this Gaius. I don't know if he's been suffering and struggling because John's really wishing him good health. But prosperity of soul what he's, is what he's really hoping for. And I'm sure that Gaius is going to get it because he's doing well. He's walking in the truth. And nothing could bring John more joy. In fact, that's what he says in verse 4. And verse 4 is such a beautiful passage. In some ways, this might be the central verse in this whole little letter. It's one that is worthy of memorizing, of, of needle pointing and, and embroidering. That's often where I've seen it. I've seen 3 John verse 4. We had it on the wall of our house when I, when I grew up. It's on the, one of the walls in our house currently. And it needs to be etched, engraven into the fleshy tables of the heart. It says simply this. 
I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. No greater joy. You know that, you parents out there, you grandparents out there, whose children are walking in truth. Just like Gaius was. I'm grateful that how specific, and this would have been very heartwarming for Gaius to hear or, or to read, but the fact that John steps back and makes things all-inclusive in verse 4. Any of my children, quote-unquote, you walk in truth and nothing could make me happier. I know that's true in my own parents' case. As they rejoice in the fact that their children are trying, I feel the same about my own. And speaking to so many of you, no wonder this is such a popular passage, but flip it around and I have sensed the reality of its opposite as well. That if we can have no greater joy than to hear that our children walk in truth, then it stands to reason that there's no greater sorrow than to hear that they no longer are. These are the parents of the prodigals who are sorrowing, who are wishing things were different. And I've met so many of you. I, I share your sorrow. I empathize with those emotions. I know the broken heart of watching loved ones struggle in their faith. It's why I'm so motivated to keep fighting the good fight and helping people learn to navigate it and giving people hope in the ultimate end of all of this because that sorrow is real. In some ways, it can't help but be that way if the joy is real as well. But think about joy going to sorrow and coming back to an even greater joy than it was before. There's, a, there's creation fall atonement, like we've talked about repeatedly. And if you have joy in your little children as they're walking in truth, and then sorrow for your teenage children or your young adult children or even not so young adult children during their fall stage, well, imagine the second round of verse 4 where you truly have no greater joy. I used to think there was no greater joy than them walking in truth, but I think there is. The greater and greatest of all joys is when children who for a time stopped walking in truth return to the covenant path. Nothing's better than that. So hold out hope for that. Be patient in the process. John then says in verse 5, Beloved, and I'm glad to hear he still loves us, Thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. So here they are serving both member and non-member alike, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. So everybody knows how good you've been to them. Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. And that's ultimately what we've been called to do, to help people find the truth, to help them on their journey home. That's it. To join them on that journey for a time and make sure that they are going forward in a godly way. Tripping up over a few things, stumbled or, or a little bit lost, that's okay, I'm here for you. Let's journey together and go in a godly direction. I know where this thing leads. You can do that to brothers and sisters. You can do that to strangers. But that's the kind of charity that is worth being spoken of. In verse 9, he says, I write unto the church, but Diophanes, and like I said, we don't know good Gaius. We really don't know Diophanes, but I don't know if we, if we should. Notice how John describes him. Diophanes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, so here's somebody that's ambitious and prideful, he receiveth us not. I wonder, is this a local leader that's getting in the way when an apostle is trying to reach the people? I mean, the people know Diophanes. He's just dropping the name, and they didn't know exactly who he's talking about. I wish we did. But he's the one that wants the preeminence. No, listen to me. Don't listen to John. Forget his letter. Send it back. Return to sender. Well, John won't stand for that. He says, wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith. 
neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. This really is evidence of some kind of schism among the saints. That you have those that follow people like Diophanes, where it's like, nope, and if you're a follower of John, then forget you. I'm going to cast you out of the church. It's like, whoa, who gave you the, the, the keys of the kingdom? You're casting me out of the church? No, you've kind of already cast yourself out. I'm with John because John's with Jesus. Careful of that, about that seduction and that deception. Antichrist, anyone? But let's get back to the better news. Verse 11 Beloved, follow not that which is evil, and I just described an example of it, but that which is good. And let's get back to a better example of that. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Now Demetrius, ooh, there's somebody worth following. Demetrius hath good report of all men, and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. So, you've got a choice to make, my friends. Will you be more like Demetrius or more like Diophanes? Do you want to do what's good or what's evil? Light, darkness, Zion, Babylon, church, world, same choices as always. Please choose wisely. And then I'll finish. Verse 13 and 14, I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. This is exactly how he ended his second letter. Now repeating in the third. I, I just, I want to come. Maybe he's like Moroni. I, I can get my message across better by speaking than by writing. Though John was an amazing writer. But no, I want to I speak face to face. So he abruptly concludes this brief missive. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. I mean, after all, ultimate truths probably can't be conveyed on paper anyway. And they can hint at things, but really, no, oh, you children, keep walking in truth. And you'll have the Holy Ghost confirming these truths upon you. You'll have it woven into the soul. At least I hope that's happening, you friends of mine. I, I love that John is, calls them that. There's a beautiful personal relationship here. That's really how truth is conveyed to. It has to be experiential. It has to be relational. We need to know each other by name. I love that at the end there. Greet the friends by name. I wish I remembered the names of every person I've ever met and worked with or served or taught or led. I've got so many students right now. I'm grateful that BYU has an app where you can have flashcards made of your students' faces and names. And I go over those flashcards so often, just repeatedly. I'm like, no, I still, I still can't remember that. And I want to, when I see this person in class, I want to be able to call them by name. I want to connect with them in a personal way so that they feel seen and known. God has, doesn't need any flashcards for us. He knows us intimately. But to know each other and to call each other by name there's something beautiful there. It helps them feel the love of God and the love of neighbor. So let's work on that, shall we? Now, the letters of John have come to an end. First John that was so filled with just incredible love and truth. Second John, third John, just brief reminders, little scraps of, of blessings sent their way. Don't forget the love of God. Hold to the truth. Pray that your children will hold to it. Avoid the apostasy around you and people that are trying to pull you away from the faith. Mm, no better time to let Jude chime in because his message is somewhat similar. There was apostasy and persecution, opposition in his day as well. Jude, again, one brief letter, one chapter is all we get. Who was Jude? Well, most likely, based on his introduction in the first, first verse or two, he was a brother of James. The same, not Peter, James, and John, but James as in the book of James, who was the half-brother of Jesus. So most likely, we're about to hear from another one of Jesus' half-brothers. In the book of Mark, it lists a bunch of Jesus' siblings, half-siblings, 
and one of them was named James, and another one was named Jude. Remember, James in Hebrew would have been Jacob, and Jude in Hebrew would have been Judah. So there's a Jesus, a little Joshua. There's a James, a little Jacob. There's a Jude, a little Judah. Hmm, look at the house of Israel all coming together at home with Mary and Joseph. It's beautiful. But Jude has something important to say. And it won't take much time to, to, to say it, but there's a lot of overlap with 2 Peter. I mentioned this last week when we studied 2 Peter, that scholars aren't sure who borrowed from whom. And did Peter write first, and then Jude was like, oh yeah, amen, Peter, I got some similar things to say. Or vice versa, Jude leading out and Peter saying, yep, same problem going on here. But to let Jude stand alone for a moment and write his letter to us so we can receive this message from him, it's a fitting end to these epistles before we turn next week to the book of Revelation, which is the ultimate grand finale of the Bible. But Jude chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, let's hear it from him. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and more than a servant, and brother of James, which means half-brother of Jesus, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Here he is writing to those who are truly living the gospel. And I love the description. Sanctified by God, preserved in Jesus Christ. Again, there's something about being clothed in Christ, covered by Christ. Therefore, we are preserved in him. And preserved against what? Well, all those outward influences. All the tugs and pulls and fiery darts of the wicked world. All the seduction and deception and the antichrist that John warned us about. Well, Jude has some similar concerns in mind. And so, yes, we need to be preserved against them. His message, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. How's that for fellowship, right? We've gone through the fellowship of his suffering. How about the fellowship of his salvation? A common salvation in Christ. Well, when I gave all diligence to write to you about that, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what they're up against, these ungodly men. To turn grace into lasciviousness sounds a lot like presuming upon grace. It's like, hey, it's all on Jesus' tab, so live however you want. Ooh, careful about that. There's mercy to to the point of enabling people in their wickedness. Nope, that has to be coupled with justice to keep it going from going too far. We've got to prove this contrary. And these people are far outside the Goldilocks zone. What's interesting is they crept in unawares. These are intruders into the kingdom of God. And you picture people like Korahor saying just enough of what people might believe to then pull them into things they shouldn't believe. Nehor doing similar things in the Book of Mormon. It's like, hey, God created you. Of course he's going to save you. I mean, God is love, right? Didn't you just read that a few pages ago? Of course he's going to love you enough to to put up with whatever mistakes you've made and just cover it with no need to repent on your own and no need to stop doing it. It's, It's all good. Oh, careful about that. Instead, hold to faith without works and it's dead. Hold to faith that is faith unto repentance. Hold to faith that makes you want to live like Christ and be even as he is in this wicked world. That's what we're, that's the challenge, okay? That's what we're trying to accomplish. And that's the faith we need to be contending for. In fact, earnestly contending. Now, as someone who's trying to fight the good fight of faith myself, I do love that phrase, earnestly contend for the faith. Then again, I know the Book of Mormon well enough to be concerned by that verb contend. Because in 3 Nephi, Jesus said, contentions of the devil. And in three different rounds in 3 Nephi, Jesus condemns the disputation by which good people are trying to arrive at good truth. It's really interesting. So 
I mean, what's wrong with it? That they were contending for the faith. And he's like, well, I'm all about the faith, but not about the contention. Made me look at the original and see, is there, or are there other ways to translate this? Most other tr translations also stick with contend. But the Greek word could also suggest some kind of wrestle. Uh, this is the same idea as, as Paul's, I fought the good fight. And, well, is he, like, come, going into fisticuffs with other people? Or is it just, this is, it, it's like, is this a military battle, or is this a, an Olympic Games? Is this a, a race that I'm trying to run? And Paul uses that kind of imagery often as well. Uh, there was a great talk that Sister Sherry Dew gave where she was talking about the gospel and said it was worth the wrestle. And wrestle is a good one because, oh, it's a fight, all right. But it's one that you shake hands afterwards, and it's just, I, I, you're trying to push me, and I'm trying to push you, and we're like wrestling buddies, okay? In a way here, to contend for the faith and to do it earnestly, true faith is worth fighting for. But don't fight other people in a way that permanently turns them away from any chance of returning to the faith themselves, okay? There's something, we have to be more careful about that to make sure that prodigal sons don't feel beaten up by the fight of faith that we've been engaged in. We're not contending against them. We're contending against evil. And we're, in the process, contending for the faith without making it a matter of contention. I, I hope that makes sense. We've got to be careful with that. Because I've seen... Well, when we talked about in, in Peter... Peter's counsel to give a reason to anyone that asketh you, a reason for the hope that is in you. But remember he said to do it with meekness and fear. I've actually had some other people, when I convey the need to do interfaith dialogue in kind ways, in Christian ways, some have pushed back, quoting Jude, and saying, no, nope, Jude said to contend for the faith. So yeah, I'm going to fight you over this. I'm going to Bible bash and proof text and, and make you feel bad. And I'm going to be disagreeable in our disagreements. Because I'm supposed to be a fighter. Contend for the faith. And it's like, ooh, well, keep that verse in context with all the others. About loving enemies and so on. Okay? Please, we especially need to do that. In verse 5, he then says, I will therefore put you in remembrance... And that's what good teachers and good leaders and good letter writers will always do. Okay, stir you up into remembrance. Though ye once knew this, he admits. So this is not new, but it might need to be renewed just so you can keep it in mind. And here it is. How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Wait, why are you reminding me about the Exodus? Well, that's not the only thing I'm trying to remind you of. Here's number two. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So that's the second thing he's trying to remind them of. He then gives them a third example in verse 7 through 8. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Oh, that's what he's been getting at. His bigger concern, like he said earlier, are those ungodly men that are turning grace into lasciviousness. Here, how does he describe them? They're filthy dreamers. They, well, like we saw in the letters of John, they're the ones going after the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of the world. They've totally succumbed to the worldly pressures. And this group is guilty of the same kinds of things. These defiling dreamers, despising dominion, that's an interesting one. They don't want to be told what to do. Was this the, the challenge that John had been writing about, about local leaders pushing people out of the church in order to stand between them and real apostles like John? No, despising dominion. And then the third, speaking evil of dignities. Oh yeah, tearing down those people who are deserving of your respect, speaking evil of the Lord's anointed, as we might say. That's what the people are up against in Jude's day, and he's warning them about it. In our own day, I sometimes worry about 
the hyper-individualism of our day. Now, I'm all for individuality, but that's only half the contrary. It's got to be coupled with community. And I'm all for diversity, but it's got to be coupled with unity. Otherwise, it leads to chaos and anarchy and these kinds of problems. Uh, if there's no deference to authority, if there's no respect to one's elders, if there's no sense of we're in this thing together, and so I'll make compromises with, with others and, and try to get along, then no wonder we're living in this fractious society that we see all around us. And by way of warning, that's why Jude has brought up these three examples. What he's really aiming for is what he said there at the end of verse 8. The problems in his day. But to help them understand what they're dealing with, let's go back to some problems of prior days. And the three he mentions are so interesting. Exodus, what's the problem going on there? All the murmur, murmur, murmur against Moses. When he's the one trying to help, it's still happening. Or what about the angels that kept not their first estate? Ooh, we're talking war in heaven? Yeah. How did they do with dignities? No, they fought against the Father and the Son. How did they do, they do with the flesh, even before they had any? <laughs> no, they wanted us to be able to come to earth and do whatever we wanted with no consequences for our sins. No, no wonder they lost the war in heaven. That was a war worth contending for. That was faith worth contending for. And then the third example, Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's an obvious one. No wonder they're in that place going after the lusts of the flesh, turning grace into lasciviousness and not only speaking evil of dignities, but doing very, or threatening very undignified things against the men of God that Lot was trying to protect under the cover of his own roof. This is a tricky one, okay? Any mention of Sodom and Gomorrah, there are those that only think of the immorality aspects, and they quote Genesis 19. There are others who only think of the neglect of the poor aspect, the lack of social justice side of things, and there they quote Ezekiel for that. Well, on, in this instance, both of those are true. I'm not trying to pit Ezekiel and, and Genesis against each other. But just in case there's anyone that wants to sweep Genesis under the rug and only emphasize the social injustices of Sodom and Gomorrah, this is a reminder here about the immorality aspect that was present as well. Okay? We need to overcome both. And then he brings in some other interesting examples. Verse 9 and 10, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, but durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. And that's it. Now, that's an interesting one because we have no record in Genesis of anything along those lines happening. Or Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. None of the books of Moses talk about Michael the archangel having to come to defend the body of Moses against the devil. And this is actually something that you can find in the Apocrypha. There's an apocryphal book called The Testament of Moses. I mean, if you think about the ascension of Moses at the end of Deuteronomy... You wonder if the devil's like, no, you cannot bring him to heaven. I, I get to keep his body here. I'm the Lord of this world with all of its sin and, yes, all of its death. And so I get to keep the bodies here. Well, you picture the Lord going, well, just wait for the resurrection. and You'll lose it all. But in the meantime, I see what you're saying. Most bodies are left on earth when a person dies. But, yeah, Moses, I've got some more work for him to do. So, no. In fact, you want to fight about this one? Hey, Michael, archangel, go and take out, take out the devil on this one. Uh, again, we don't know any specifics on this, but it is fascinating that Jude is either referring to the apocryphal testament of Moses or he knows something that we don't have record of. But what the point he's making that's interesting is he didn't rail against the devil. And you'd think, I mean, again, back in light of contending earnestly for the faith, if anybody deserves to contend, it would be the, the archangel. And anyone deserving to be contended against, it's the devil. And yet here, Jude is very, kind of, this is a calm description. The archangel didn't go off on the devil. No railing accusations. He just said, the Lord rebuke thee. 
and then kind of turned his back and Moses is coming with me and I'll leave you with the Lord and, and that's good enough for me. That doesn't sound very contentious. It's, we actually saw this in a previous letter where there was this sense of heaven doesn't speak disrespectfully of hell, even though hell is always raging against heaven. That's interesting to me too. Maybe that's heaven leaving the door open if hell ever wants to change its mind. Maybe this is showing kindness to the prodigal in hopes the prodigal will someday come to himself and come back home. Interesting things to ponder. But then in verse 10, he says, But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. So yeah, you're talking about stuff you don't know. What do you know? Uh, things I don't want to know. Uh, we often mock what we don't understand, and yet we do understand things that we were never intended to. And who are we listening to? Who are our conversation partners? Are we trying to go the way of the world or come into the kingdom of God? Jude then says in verse 11, Woe unto them. Woe to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Woe to the murmurers in the Exodus. Woe to the angels who lost the war in heaven. But woe to anyone who's doing similar things in our day. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor, or Korah, as it would be pronounced in the Old Testament. Now, again, he's using three more examples. He did a round of three previously. Here's a new round of three. Cain, we know, to murder and get gain. Is that what you guys are planning? Balaam, remember him and his talking donkey? He's the one that's flirting with, with temptation and trying to serve two masters, both God and the world. I, I don't want to do anything against God, but hey, maybe he'll change his mind and let me curse his people. Sure, why not? I'll go with, with you because you have so much to offer me. Hmm, is that what people in Jude's day are dealing with as well? And then the third one, the gainsaying of Kor. Korah was the story of these 250 princes that rebelled against Moses and Aaron, saying, why do you have authority? We're just as good as you are. And there were some problems that came as a result. How's that for speaking evil of dignities and despising dominion? Okay, so Jude just keeps bringing in story after story after story from the Old Testament to warn people, you're falling prey to the same stuff. And to them, he says, or of them, he says, these are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Whew, powerful metaphors. And he's just rapid fire, boom, 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 trying to let them see, do you know who you're like? Here's example after example from the Old Testament. Let's go even non-scriptural. Do you know what you're like in terms of nature? This is some of the language that Peter had used too. Spots and blemishes. Here it's a spot in your feast of charity. There's the agape feast. There's the communion meal that the Christians gathered together to celebrate. And there are people there that should not be. They're evil, ungodly people creeping in unawares, trying to seduce you away from the true faith. Be careful about that. These are clouds that aren't bringing welcome water. These are withered trees, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. I mean, it's interesting analogies. Wandering stars, the kind that you would not be wise to set your course by, they're wandering, they're falling, they're going to lead you astray. It's exactly what they're trying to do. So please be aware of it. He says in verse 14, and Enoch also, this Jude loves the Old Testament. He knows it like the back of his hand. Here he's invoking the example of Enoch, the seventh from Adam, who prophesied of these saying, behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000s of his saints. How's that for the second coming? In fact, how's that for the return of Enoch's city? Zion from above reuniting with Zion from below. Well, one of the things that's going to happen at that moment, look at the rest of the verse. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. 
which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I mean, how many times do you have to say ungodly before it captures our attention? These ungodly people doing ungodly things, and the ungodly are rejoicing in such ungodliness. No wonder he warned us earlier of the ungodly men that are creeping around unawares. They don't want you to know about their wickedness. In fact, they don't want to know about their own. They don't want to be called out. They'd rather sin in ignorance. Self-deception, like we talked about before. But what will happen at the coming of Christ and the coming of the true Zion? There's no hiding your sins anymore. There's no more justification or rationalization. There's no more self-deception. The light of the world has come and shined it into every corner of darkness to the point that even the ungodly can fully and finally admit their ungodliness. And they'll admit it as such. That was not what God would have had me do. This is what Jacob says in 2 Nephi 9, that they'll all admit to the Lord, your judgments are just. You gave me the chance to repent, but I didn't take it. Therefore, my sins are mine. My transgressions are, remain with me. I never handed them over alongside my broken heart. I'm fascinated by Jude's language here. He is trying to expose the counterfeits of his day. I love his command of the Old Testament. I'm impressed by his analogies. I hope he's painting a clear enough picture that we can choose to repent. And if, we've, uh, if we are guilty of any ungodly deeds, we can wake up to that fact and repent of them now instead of waiting till Zion comes and forces the realization that we're not part of Zion ourselves. With that, he says in verse 16, these, these enemies, these ungodly, are murmurers, complainers, just like we saw in the Exodus, walking after their own lusts, just like we saw in Sodom and Gomorrah, their mouth speaking great swelling words, like we saw in the war in heaven, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage, just like we saw in Korah, just like we saw in Balaam, Oh, people kissing up to others in hopes of climbing the social ladder, of gaining economically or politically. Oh, admiration, advantage. If you're trying to climb those ladders, those ladders are leaning up against the wrong kinds of walls. Oh, ascend the mountain of the Lord instead, and it'll put all of these things in perspective. Jacob's ladder. Oh, that's a better one to climb. There's a stairway to heaven. But then Jude says in verse 17, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts, there's that word again, these be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. And what I love there is that Jude is pointing out the fact that none of this should come as a surprise. We're living in the days prophesied of where there would be, as he puts it here, mockers in the last time. The seducers, the deceivers. Again, go back to Matthew 24. And what did Jesus say? There will be false Christs and false teachers and false prophets. And they will deceive, if it were possible, even the very elect according to the covenant. But what did he say in Matthew 24? But I tell you this beforehand. I need you to know in advance it's going to be this way so it doesn't catch you off guard. So their loss of faith doesn't cause your loss of faith. Instead, their loss can be your confirmation. It's like, yes, this is exactly how Jesus said it would be. This is the day of mockery, of ungodliness, of apostasy, of people creeping in unawares of a loss of faith and an increased importance to contend earnestly to preserve it. I hope Jude's original audience took this seriously, but I hope even more that his latter-day audience is doing likewise. Because we live in a day of mockers and ungodly lusts that should also confirm to us the timetable of it all, that the Lord said it would be this way in the last days. 
Jude then says in 20 and 21, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And that's what we need to be doing. If we're going to overcome those mockers, if we're going to avoid apostasy, if we're going to contend earnestly for the faith that was delivered to us, then we're going to have to build ourselves on that faith. There's a rock that wise men and women will build upon. Okay? Pray for the Holy Ghost. He will keep you firm. He will assure you, whereby ye know that you're on the right path. Right? And then he says, by way of invitation and encouragement, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's really what's going to help us stay grounded and unshaken. It'll be prayer. It'll be the Holy Ghost. It'll be the love of God. And remember, the love of God is made manifest by giving us commandments, and we show our love of Him by actually keeping them. Yeah, that'll keep us in the faith also. Again, think of, think of Paul's words, grounded, rooted, established, settled. Will we stay firm? I love that Jude, that Jude is emphasizing this during his period. Then, verse 22, And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. I mean, there's some strong conviction there. Hating sin, ooh, that's strongly worded, but not hating the sinner, right? We are being careful to respond to different people differently. And what's interesting here is some people, you're going to have to save with fear. And is that your fear or theirs? Is that your reverence? Or are we talking actual fear? Or do we have to use strong language and help them see the consequences of their sins and almost scare them out of sin? Speaking justly would do that. Okay? Uh, Jacob said, or Enos said, it was, it was that way in his day. Nothing else would work. Mormon said it was that way in his day because nothing else would work. So yeah, some you've got to save with fear. Some you have to pull out of the fire because for some reason they're running headlong into disaster. We saw that in the book of Peter last week. It's like, no, I'm going to turn you away, you crash test dummy. I don't want you to, to run headlong into the brick wall. Instead, I'm going to pull you out of the fire. That's tricky because, yeah, I'm supposed to honor agency. But maybe in this instance, I'm going to have to err on the side of justice instead of erring on the side of mercy because I know where they're headed. So, no, in, in this, maybe I need to pull you away from the fire until you realize how much the flames will hurt you. And then you'll probably make better decisions in the future. We're talking spots in the flesh. We're talking stains on the garments. And you've got to come to a point where you can't stand any of that. Again, love sinner. But those sins, I don't want to have anything to do with them. But that puts in perspective what he said at the beginning of verse 22. Some people, though, mm, you're going to have to make a difference. Because you have compassion. This is where we have to treat people on an individual basis. And honor rules, but also recognize exceptions. That for the most part, no, we're pulling people out of fire. We're hating sin. But there are those that, hmm, I have to make a difference out of compassion. I'm not trying to justify their iniquity. Far from it. Okay, I'm certainly not having them presume upon the Lord's grace. But to be a little more patient with them, to understand that this process is probably going to be a long one. And so with my compassion, I'm going to make a difference here because I see how hard they're trying, but also what they're up against. In essence, I'm going to grade on a curve, okay? Or I'm going to give different grades based on different work in my class because I know my students well enough to see who's meeting potential and who's falling short and who's struggling against bigger odds. Or I'm, these are judges in, in uh, the diving competition and, the, and figure skating uh, that they're taking degree of difficulty into consideration. It's like, yes, that diver made a bigger splash. But do you have any idea how hard that kind of dive was? So yes, I'm going to make a difference in this case. Compassion commands that I do. That, that's good parenting. That's good leading. Okay? That's good teaching. By the way, I was so intrigued by that phrase, having compassion, making a difference, that I looked it up in all these other translations to see if there was any nuance there. 
And these were three translations that really struck me. First, from the New International Version. Be merciful to those who doubt. Hmm, that's interesting. Or the New Living Translation. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Or the Contemporary English Version. Be helpful to all who may have doubts. Hmm, that's what these translators saw in the Greek behind compassion and making a difference. It was doubt. It was wavering. It was struggling in the faith that needs to be earnestly contended for, but has come under attack. It's like, I know what you're up against. I know what these mockers do and how they make you feel. So if you're struggling, don't be ashamed. I will be merciful to you. In fact, I will help you. Be as helpful as I possibly can, because I get it too. We need to approach doubters in that way. Not as doubters, but people who are struggling with doubt, but are seeking truth so that they can hold to the faith that once was delivered by the saints. There's beautiful advice here. And in those, along those lines, in that light, Jude then concludes his letter with, with praise for the Lord he loves. The half-brother he didn't quite understand near, until near the end of his life. And it includes one of my favorite titles for Jesus I've ever heard. And the fact that it's coming from his younger half-sibling, I think, is just beautiful. It's a long one. Uh, it's one that Jesus wouldn't use very often, I'm sure, because it's just so long-winded. But you're going to need this many words to describe Jesus along these lines, especially in light of what we just saw about what we're up against. And seducers and deceivers, mockers, pulling us away, trying to trip us in our faith so that we fall. It's with that in mind that Jude gives his final oh, words of blessing and encouragement and gratitude and describes his older brother like this. Verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Some people call that a doxology, when you're offering praise to God. And there's beautiful praise there. The only wise, give him glory. Give him majesty. He deserves it all. Grant him all the dominion and power that you could ask because he'll know what to do with it. And what will he do with it? He'll keep you from falling. That's the title I love so much. Who is Jesus to me? He's the one that can keep me from falling. He's the one that can help my children walk in truth. He's the one that will redeem them when they struggle and help support them whenever the, we the knees start to weaken and faith starts to fail. I am grateful for that Savior, for that Lord, the Lord of the creation, the Lord of the fall, and especially the Lord of the atonement. If you're worried, if you're starting to fall prey to the scoffers, Please come unto Christ and see in him the one who can keep you from falling. Now, with this, we only have the book of Revelation left. And we'll turn to that one next week. It is a fitting grand finale to the New Testament. It will bring us through the last days and off into the end of the world. Millennium, celestial kingdom, it's all there. Uh, the next three weeks are going to be glorious. I hope that you'll really think your way through them because there's some difficult symbolism. But I do love that Jude is what prepares us for that next step because Jude warns us of what we're up against, right? But I also love that the letters of John that we've studied, this week's lesson is such perfect preparation for next week's because it establishes us in the love of God. It warns us about the wicked world that we have to overcome. And that's a huge theme of the book of Revelation. But to hold to the love of God to get us through it. In fact, if I can do this uh, before we, we end, I got some interesting comments the last two weeks where they were like, whoa, 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 you finished Peter and you finished James, but you never went through 
the highlighted one-liners that we come, came to love from Paul. And I totally apologize for that. I had intended to do that for Paul, but it never crossed my mind to keep the streak alive. I didn't know you liked it so much. So for those of you who are actually able to endure to the end, and that in and of itself is amazing. You deserve any little gift I can give you. For you who are hanging on to the end and have been wanting that brief review of just no commentary, just one-liners, don't worry, the Spirit will bring to my remembrance the stuff that we learned about it. Well, I'm happy to renew the tradition and do that here for John, 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 Jude. So, by way of review, some beautiful one-liners. How's this for a list from these letters? God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Walk even as He walked. The true light now shineth. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. Love not the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. The same anointing teacheth you of all things. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. When he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Marvel not if the world hate you. Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Try the spirits, whether they are of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. God is love. As he is, so are we in this world. Perfect love casteth out fear. We love him because he first loved us. His commandments are not grievous. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. He that hath the Son hath life. I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, that our joy may be full. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Earnestly contend for the faith, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Him that is able to keep you from falling. That is the Lord of life. That is the Lord of love. And I love him because he first loved me. He loves you. And I pray you've been able to feel that as we've studied these words this week. I pray that the love of God has been made manifest so clearly that it is coaxing you out of the wicked world, that it is preserving you in Christ. Because what we're about to study in Revelation, what we're about to live through in the last days, will require all the strength, all the faith that we can muster. More importantly, it will require all the love of God. That is what overcomes the world. That is what prepares us for the last days. That is what brings us back to God. It's his love.